next guest is a man known for his controversial views. He says, for example, that if you believe in God, you may as well believe in fairies. His latest book is about evolution, which he calls not just the only game in town, but also the greatest show on earth. Would you please welcome Richard Dawkins. Welcome to Lele Show. Thank you. Uh, another book, another day, another chat show. Uh, why did you write this one? It's about the most, just about the most important thing you could imagine a book being about. It's about why we're all here, why we exist, why animals and plants, just about everything we see exists. That's the most rivetingly exciting subject. Could have been written any time. I take it, though, you mean why write it now? Why now, exactly. Right. Less interesting question. Okay, well, I'll take the answer. If you could make it interesting, I'd appreciate it. Well, it is true that there is poll information which suggests that in the United States, somewhat more than 40% of the population thinks that the entire world is less than 10,000 years old. Now, that is a bizarre circumstance that 40% of the population of the major industrial nation in the, in the world should have a view which is so incredibly out of tune with reality. And so that's one reason why it was necessary and to you write you felt it's book. time to call a halt yeah. to yeah. such. But what would they feel about uh, your writings? Do they think it's just uh, that, that you're being unfair to them and that uh, you have it wrong? They think that everything in the book of Genesis is literally true and therefore if science contradicts the book of Genesis, science must be wrong and Genesis must be right. Well, what's your take on what actually happened vis-a-vis -vis humans arriving here in the state we are in? When, when did that happen in, in, in your... When did humans arrive on, on, yes, on, on Earth? Yes, as we, as, we can, as we know that. Well, it was a gradual process. It's a bit like saying, when did a child become an adult? Yeah. I mean, you know, by convention, we say it happened on the stroke of midnight on the 18th birthday, but we know that actually it's a gradual process. So there never was a moment when the first human was born. Um, the first human looked exactly like the, the last ape, so to speak. So... Um, but if you put a figure of about 100,000 years, that would be, by about 100,000 years, you'd be getting humans that were exactly like us, as far as their anatomy is concerned. Probably not as far as their uh, culture is concerned. They yes. didn't have painting and things like that. And how different are we from other animals, then, broadly? Well, we're hugely different from other animals in that we have language, we have art, we have mathematics, philosophy. Um, we have all sorts of emotions that other animals probably don't have. Yes. And what about the notion of God, then? Where does God fit into all of this? Well, God, as I see it, has rather little to do anymore. I mean, there was a time when, when God had uh, a lot to do in people's minds. He made the world, he made, he made life, made humans. That's all out now. We don't, we don't need God anymore to explain anything. And I think that pretty much means we don't need God at all. Yeah, but who are we? Because, like, pretty much everyone watching, well, many people watching the TV would think that, uh, watching us tonight, would say, well, I don't belong to that we. Uh, that God is very much in their thesis. And, and no doubt it is, and no doubt there are people who get plenty of consolation from the idea of God, and no doubt there are people who think they talk to God and think God talks to them, uh, but that doesn't mean he's really there. So where is he? It doesn't exist. Not in the slightest? I, I would have thought, my, there, there's certainly no evidence that, that, that any kind of God exists, no. So what is the Vatican then? What, Toy Town? Or, uh... Yeah. Um, I mean, a gigantic and very expensive and very rich waste of time. There are many people watching tonight <laughs> who will say that, you know, much of their lives have been lived based on a belief system that involves God very much being in existence and that uh, this is what uh, they've, you know, lived their life based on. Uh, what do you say to them? Well, that of course is true. There are many people who think exactly that. It doesn't mean they're right. And your thoughts on their, on their, their beliefs? Well, they're misguided, mistaken. Do you feel sorry for them? Uh, yes. Yeah. Why? Well, because if people have really sincerely lived their lives under a delusion and feel that they needed it for support and for uh, living a full life, if you suddenly pull it out from under them, then they're naturally going to feel somewhat um, bereft. So where did the notion of God come from then? Oh, well, I think it goes back a very long way. I think it partly comes from... The, the desire to understand. I mean, we look around the world and we see what an incredibly elaborate, complicated place it is. We're used to the idea that complicated things must be made by something or someone. And so it's very easy to see why the idea of God should have grown up. And it took a very long time. It took until the middle of the 19th century, until people realized that there was another, a better, more economical explanation for all that. Do you see God as, uh, as believable as the Easter Bunny? Pretty much, yes. 
I mean, would you equate them? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, they're, they're, it's, that sounds facetious because, of course, nobody believes in the Easter Bunny, but lots of people believe in God. But if you actually examine the amount of evidence there is for either, it's equally, equally sparse. See, God fills a, a space for a lot of people in their lives, as you, as you probably know from talking to people who believe in God, uh, with spiritual uh, soul and so on. And, and people who have religion and believe in God might feel that the road you travel is a very lonely one. Not at all lonely. I've got great friends and, and I have a wonderful life with, with human companionship. That's real warm human companionship. It's really there. That's not imaginary. That's really there. By the way, this has nothing to do with the new book. You're, you're asking me yeah. questions about the previous book, The yeah. God Delusion. Yeah. I'm also um, asking questions that are interesting um, oh yeah, to, yeah, to yeah, us. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's, I'm not being smart about it. I'm just telling the truth. Yeah. So what happens then as you see it uh, when we die? Well, some of us get buried and some of us get cremated. And where do we go? <laughs> where do we go as you see it? Is that it? Game That's over? It. Ga game, game over, but the game while it lasts is pretty wonderful. I mean, uh, what happens when we die is the same as before we were born. I mean, you know, we didn't know anything about it when Henry VIII was alive and we wouldn't know anything about it in 500 years' time. Do you fear death? No, I fear dying. Why? Uh, because I'm not, unlike my dog, allowed to go to the vet and be painlessly put to sleep. But because I belong to this privileged uh, species, Homo sapiens, which is the only one that is not allowed to be painlessly put out of its misery. Okay. I would like to die under a general anaesthetic, just as I'd like to have my appendix out under a general anaesthetic. Have you, have you, had, uh, have you thought about, with the, at the risk of being morbid about you, and I'm not, uh, have you thought about your own funeral? Yeah, I have. I mean, I, I thought I might like to ask for the music. You know, the elephant march from Aida. A uh, very triumphal uh, trumpet, uh, trumpet music. Why? Sing me out. Why? A triumphant exit. But why do you want a ceremony to see you off? Well, I have organized ceremonies for dearly loved colleagues, uh, funeral ceremonies. Uh, I've organized... Um, readings from their favorite poetry, favorite music, um, eulogies from uh, friends who knew and loved them. Yeah. Um, I think it is an important, I think humans do need ritual, they do need rites of that sort. And when somebody dies, I think it's right to, um, to give them a proper send-off, some sort of a wake, uh, which um, remembers them and um, which makes you feel you've somehow fulfilled something. Okay, I want to talk to a member of the audience who, who, who know, Father Brendan Parsimano. Um The Vatican is toy town, God is the Easter Bunny, and you as a priest have been wasting your time. Well, I don't, I wouldn't exactly put it like that. I'd say, to go back to the things you, uh, Richard was saying earlier on, I wouldn't say, I mean, I have no problem with science. I mean, my mother left school at 16, and uh, she read The Origin of Species at breakfast time. It was the only time she got free in the morning. And she followed that by reading the Bible, things she'd never done in her life. So I think in Ireland we don't have the problem you mentioned in the States. Uh, my first year in university we did a book, I'm sure you, you appreciate John Maynard Smith's Theory of Evolution. That was taught by a priest. In other words, it isn't a problem in Ireland, the, very, the reason you both wrote that book, because we never saw, certainly I never felt there was any conflict between science or evolution and my belief at all whatsoever. But I, did, I do feel there is, I mean, I've read a lot of your work and have I to say, I still think my favourite book of yours is The Ancestor's Tale. I think it's totally brilliant. Do you, do you like what he writes? I like, I, I like some of what he writes more than others. Where do you, what's your content? Excited? contention with what he writes? The contention I'd have would be, at least I have two or three of them, but my, the, first, the, the most obvious one yeah. would be science. That I think, that, uh, I know I'm not trying to annoy you Richard, but I think he believes in science in a sense that he, he, like, he feels that science explains everything. But I mean the one thing science doesn't explain is science itself. I'm talking about the natural sciences including biology. So I feel there really is a problem here because if you like the word science comes from a Latin word meaning knowledge and I think there's other forms of knowledge which are just as well grounded as the, no the knowledge of the natural sciences. So there are questions that are not asked by the natural sciences. So I've always felt in a certain sense you shouldn't give answers to questions you haven't asked. You might argue, Richard Dawkins, you might argue that, that with, with your theory and, and evolution and so forth there's always there's evidence, there's things to look at, to point to. Uh, what do you point to when it comes to God? 
I would say... Because one of the good things about his book that he's mentioned there, and I've seen the reviews, I haven't had time to read it, yes. but one of the good points about it, part of it is written like a detective story, am I right? And there's clues, and you're spotting the clues. And I would say one of the obvious clues to the existence of God, remember, we're not talking about the God of Christianity, of, of the Old Testament, we're talking about a God at the level of pure yeah. reason. Uh, effectively, the fact that you have a reality, namely the Big Bang, you have a question there that cannot be answered by physics or astronomy. And if you read the big guys, like Stephen Hawking, a famous guy, you've seen him in his wheelchair and so on, but a book he wrote with another guy way back in the 70s, George Ellis, it's quite clear that we've come to a singularity here, a singularity thing we can't repeat it again and again, which is the start of everything, yeah. which we cannot explain by physics or astronomy. And it's, that's, that's, and it's not to jump in and say, oh, now we have a chance. I think there's actually a question here, the classic question that Richard has been asked many a time, why is there something rather than nothing? And biology isn't meant, biology is, and my equivalent of biology is something like, if, if you like, if I can make a parallel between a farmer and a supermarket. The farmer produces the stuff, the supermarket uh, has selling is processed it. The biologist deals with the stuff as it's presented. It doesn't explain where the blinking fruit came from. Okay. Hands up everyone in this audience who believes in God, please. Hands nice and high, please. Just give us an, an idea. Okay, what do you, what you call that, Richard? About, what, uh, oh. 50, 60, 70 percent? I would say more, if anything. 75. Let's, let's, let's see those down. who don't. Hands up those who do not believe in God at all, yeah. which is a sprinkling, which is quite interesting. What do you think of that? I mean, it's very, it's, I think oh, that yeah. would be I mean, typical just the result, I would so, are, are, so all hands that went up the first time deluded? Well, look, why don't I just come back yeah, and Yeah, please do. I'm a friend in person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, First, I'm delighted you brought the, the subject back, in a way, to the topic of this book, rather than the previous book, which was, which was The God Delusion. Um, now, when you say that I believe in science, and, you know, why do I, I believe in science? Really, because it works. I mean, the, the evidence is there. Um, it's a kind of um, self-validating process, because as a result of science, th these television cameras work. Planes fly, cars go. Um, day after day, we see that, that the, the evidence of our eyes is that science works. Now, when you were asked about the evidence for God, you used my analogy of the detective coming on the scene after the crime, and you infer it from all the clues that are left lying around. That's what I used to say how we know evolution has happened, because we can't see it, because it happened mostly before we were born. Um, but I don't actually think it's right to say that the world is littered with evidence for God. Um, I think when you look at it carefully, it turns out this, this particular detective has got it wrong. Um, the, you, you think the evidence is there, but I think if you look at it really carefully, I mean, before Darwin came along, I mean, you, of course, as, a, as any intelligent theologian would, believe in evolution. But before Darwin came along, most people didn't. Now, Darwin changed our minds on that. And I suspect that we'll find that other people are going to come along and change our minds about the other alleged clues that you think you've seen. Okay, let's talk about just another element of the book I'd like to ask you about is the future for evolution. Where, where do we go from here? Where does the human go from here as you see it? In evolution? Yeah, where do you see it? Um, well, remember that when we are uh, thinking about the future, we're used to, uh, we're accustomed to thinking about a historical time yeah. scale, which is centuries. Uh, you're not going to see much evolution in centuries. So we've got to look forward, say, a couple of million years in order to give that question an in interesting answer. Mm -hmm. um, in a couple of million years, the chances are we'll be extinct because most species do go extinct. Uh, if we, but on the other hand, there is something rather special about the human species. If any species could protect itself against going extinct the way the dinosaurs did, it might be ours because we do have the technology to do that. So let's suppose that we do manage to survive through 10 million years. What are we going to look like then? Nobody has the faintest idea but in order for any particular hypothesis to be true, like you might say, perhaps the brain will go on getting bigger. And the dominant trend in the last three million years of our evolution is that the brain has swollen up from the size of a chimpanzee's brain about three million years ago, Lucy's brain was about the size of a chimpanzee's brain, to now. Is it going to be much bigger again in 10 million years' time? Well, um, only if it's true that the cleverest or the brainiest anyway, the individuals with the biggest brains, are the ones who have the most children. So is there any evidence that the people who have the most children are the brightest or the cleverest or the ones with the biggest brains? I don't think so. Um, but it would have to be so in order for natural selection to favor 
the enlargement of the brain. It must have been so during the last three million years, otherwise brain size would not have increased the way it has since the time of Lucy three million years ago. Okay, well thank you for coming to see us this thank evening. Thank you very much. Richard Dog is the book, by the way, is there. It's the greatest show on earth.